you agree? Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Jordan's Famous Friends. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with my good friend, Josh Weiland, uh, somebody I've admired for a while um, for their work in the pastoral field. Uh, Josh is pastor of Wawa Sea Community Bible Church over in Milford, Indiana, um, doing a lot of things over uh, just in the middle of four cornfields. Josh, first and foremost, uh, welcome. Hey, thanks, Jordan. It's yeah, good man. to be Dude. So, uh, backtrack just a second. Um, did I get your name right? Yeah, you did. <laughs> every you time, got... every time I talk to you, I don't know if it's Weiland or Weiland, and then I always second guess myself because I'm like, I know it's Weiland, but then no, I go back Weiland. and I'm yeah. like, I'm like, why do I say Weiland? I don't know. That's yeah, all good. <laughs> and then uh, the church you pastor is uh, Wawa Sea Community Bible Church, correct? Correct. And then with, uh, but it's in Milford. Yeah, address is Milford. We're kind of like right between Milford and Syracuse. Okay, so it the would, community is called Wawa C. Gotcha. So would people say they go to church in Milford, Syracuse, or Wawa C? It depends where they're coming from. Oh, so just the area or whatever the case. Yeah, is. Yeah, it really depends. All right, just curious. Okay, so well, they, just, they usually just call it, call it Wawa C though, for the most part. So everybody just says like, I go to church in Wawa C. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Good deal. Congratulations. How long have you been there? I've been here twenty one years. That's a long time, my friend. It's a very long time. What's the average stint of a pastor? Like three or four years? I don't know. It's not, it's gone up, but it's not, it's single digits for sure. That's unbelievable. Why do you think you've stayed there for 20, what did you say, 21, 22? You're in your 22nd. So in 22 in, right now. In your 22nd year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So why would you say you stayed there that long? You well, part of it out. is every time I've tried to leave, God has slammed the door shut. So that would be one, that would be one reason. You can't get out. He's stuck. Dude needs to come help you get out of. I know, right? <laughs> Man. No, it's true. I mean, that sounds really negative, but it's true. Like the handful of times where there's been an opportunity and feeling like, oh, maybe that's it. And, uh, but then, yeah, the door just, the door goes shut. That's and so, so funny. God's just had me here. It's, uh, but it's been a good place. I mean, people, the other side of it is I think people genuinely love me. I feel loved. Um, I don't feel like a typical pastor in the, that sense. Yeah. Like I feel like I'm just one of the people here, which is a really good thing. And I think that's part of why I'm, I'm loved that way. Yeah. It's your church just as much as it's their church. Exactly. Even though it's Christ church. Right. But I mean, at the yeah, same time, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, it's, um, tell people that a lot, like uh, I'm a member here too, you know? Yeah, like if I wasn't, if we lived here and I wasn't going, wasn't the pastor, I'd still go to church here. Yeah, I would too. I always tell people I'm a little biased, but like if I lived in the area, I would go to where I go. So yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, so yeah, you've achieved a lot, obviously, like in uh, your your 22nd year, um, you studied under some some pretty influential and, and important people, I would say, in the pastoral world, have some strong connections. You're not just the pastor of Wawa C. Uh, you're also involved in the Evangelical Free Church uh, of America. You hold a couple positions there. What are those? Um, so I serve on the board in our district. Um, so I'm the, what am I this year? I think I'm the vice chairman. Do they change your roles? No, it, it, I think it was last year, but I just, I don't know. I, so I'm on the... <laughs> I'm on the board. Don't tell anybody that <laughs> you're supposed to know what you do. <laughs> no, so I serve, I serve on the board and then uh, help also too with uh, leading a group just for pastors and churches our size. So 200 to 450. Also do some vision consulting with some churches. And so it's been good. Yeah. So take us back a little bit. Just, um, you know, people are listening. They could be from your church. They could be from all over. You know, it just depends on how people get into the platform or whatever. But how did you kind of get, you know, summarize that? Like, how did you kind of get to this point in your life? Why pastoral work? Um, you know, pivotal, let's say like two or three, like pivotal moments or decisions that mm. shaped you getting to this point. What would you say like the, those things were? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I grew up going to a really traditional church. Um, mainline Lutheran church and, you know, learned all kinds of things about God growing up. So memorized creeds, memorized all that sort of stuff. I always joke. It was kind of as close to being Catholic as you can get without a Pope. Yeah. Diet Catholic that was, is what that they was call how I grew Lutherans. up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, no offense so like, to you Lutherans out there. That's just, that's no, no, no. It's, it. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It was good stuff, but I didn't realize anything about it. Like what I was actually learning probably till I was in college. So in high school, um, it's a long story, but through the influence of uh, my science and algebra teacher, uh, ended up becoming a Christian, 
uh, joining another youth group. You didn't grow up in uh, Wawasi though, right? Like this is. No, I grew up in Iowa. This is Iowa. Yeah. So this is back in Iowa, small town in Northwest Iowa. And, um, my senior year, they were, they planted a new church and it was a free church, evangelical free church. And, uh, so got connected there. Um, that was the first time I'd ever heard of Moody Bible Institute. The guy who came, his name's Doug. He's been pretty influential in my life. For those of you who don't know that, it'd be in Chicago, Illinois. Yeah. And so I took off for Iowa state studying architecture. Um, but before I did, I had a handful of people ask me if I'd ever considered vocational ministry. And I was like, no, not really. Got to Iowa State, um, got involved with crew, and then also at a at another free church there, actually, helping with youth ministry, and kind of got asked some of those same questions again. And uh, so it was on spring break. What's crew? Campus, campus, uh, what's crew? Campus, 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 crew, campus, crew, campus crusade. Campus crusade for Christ. I don't know what, yeah. why they call it CRU, because I know it's campus crusade, but I don't know where that acronym comes from. I think they just shortened it. They did. They shortened it because they were having because of the reference to the crusades. So they were losing there influence with, um, especially Muslim, Muslim groups and Arab groups and things from that, that region of the world. Gotcha. So yeah, anyway, you're, you, uh, you're in, involved in crew at Iowa state. Yeah. Involved in crew at Iowa state mm-hmm. went to, uh, a retreat in Florida over spring break. And that's just when I got really laid on my heart. I need to pursue ministry. So came back, uh, sent my app overnight to Moody, and got in and then um, was at Moody for four and a half years. And then after Moody ended up out here. Wait, so how long were you at Iowa total? So I was at Iowa State just for a year. Okay, so just you transferred like after the year was over or like in the middle yep. of it? Yeah, after it was over. Okay, so you technically you've gone to college then for five years. Yeah. Because yep. you were at Moody for four and then uh, obviously the, yeah, anyway. Okay. So that's, that's one, like that's a pivotal moment. Like keep going. Yeah. So that was a huge one. Um, I think deciding to come here obviously was a big one. You know, I'd been looking for a job. I almost ended up out in San Francisco at a church out there in the Bay area doing junior high ministry. Mm. Um, what was the, what was the, what was the like catalyst? Like, uh, I mean, you could do, you could do youth ministry or you could go like over into, um, like lead senior pastor type stuff. Why, why choose one over the other? I don't know. I've never, I never really aspired to and to be a senior pastor. I just always, I think probably because God reached me when I was in high school. And so that was my world. Hmm. You know, it just seemed, seemed natural to me. Yeah. Um, that's where I wanted to be. And I thought it was an opportunity to use some of my gifts, maybe the most too, in that world versus a lead role. Um, so yeah, pursued youth ministry. Um, when I was at, when I was at Moody, I, I was involved in junior high ministry at Harvest Bible Chapel. And the then, uh, Harvest Bible Chapel. Yeah, the yeah. original. So I was there when they first started planting churches. Yeah, that was way back. Yeah, it's a long time ago. Not to date you at all. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so uh, My bad. <laughs> no, you're good. So we thought we were going out. I thought I was going out to, to San Francisco as a friend of mine. Uh, her dad's was connected there at that church. And then they had hired a new new senior pastor that same week I was out there and he kind of put the kibosh and everything. So ended up going home working and, uh, I was just kind of tired of work being at home. I was probably going to move back to Chicago, do grad school or something and got a call from what So they got my name through Moody and, um, next thing I knew I was here. Whoa. So then like literally 20 years later, like you're where you are right now. Yeah, I'm still here. Wow, that's crazy. So did you start at Wawasi in the lead senior pastor position, or did you start with youth? No, I started in youth ministry. Okay, so it went from youth. So how did you go from youth to senior pastor position? So, I mean, that would be another another thing there, too. So started in youth. The guy who was the lead guy here at the time um, was let go in August, um, not for any issue other than it just wasn't a good fit. And then... Uh, secretary at the time had been leading worship and she got married and left. And so I was the only one on staff that fall. Hmm. Um, so about six months in and then just served youth ministry grew a lot during those first three, four years. Um, and then brought in another guy who was here for about four years in the lead role. And then when he stepped down, I was on that search committee. And, um, after about a year, they're like, Hey, we think you should put your name in. So I ended up doing that. Um, and yeah, they, they hired me. So, and like ever since legitimately. Yep. 
Yeah, so it's been 14, 15 years in the lead role. That's unbelievable. Like, I mean, for a pastor, that's just that's a significant amount of time in, in one spot, which is, is totally fine. Actually, as a matter of fact, like that's one thing about the evangelical free church that I I really uh admire is pastors are are in positions for significant time periods. You know, it's not yeah, like there's to be around. a lot who stick around. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of guys like um in other denominations, which we won't name, but like they get moved around and pushed around and all that other stuff. And it's like, you know, they, uh, the free church likes to see guys stay in their groove and, you know, keep going in that trajectory, which is super beneficial. in, in my mind, I know some people probably disagree with that, but it is what it is. No, it's true. Okay. With all that experience, all that, uh, all that life experience, um, obviously in the pastoral world, like books have a pretty profound impact on our lives. Um, I'm sure you're going to say the Bible. I'm not going to like speculate it, but <laughs> um, books are authors that have greatly like influenced you, played a role in shaping your perspective, you know, guiding you along a path, like top three, maybe even four. I know sometimes that's a lot for people like books that have had that impact on your life. What would you say they are? One that comes to mind right away is uh, from when I was in college book called uh roaring lambs by bob briner okay he was uh and i guess i should ask why like why, why yeah why? so he, he's kind of some kind of he was some kind of media executive i don't remember exactly his background but basically wrote this this story of how christians should um with their witness influence culture not hide from it especially in the the realm of the arts and so i think that's why it connected with me so much was just some of my uh, creative background with studying architecture and love and design and anything creative that way. So I think it, um, it just helped me see that like, it's not an all or nothing. Like a, like the, like as if the only way to serve God was to go into ministry, mm. even though I was pursuing ministry already at the time, I, I think it was a little bit of permission to still be me in the sense of that creative side. Kind of like you could still have, uh, I don't want to call them hobbies, but I don't know what else to say. You know, like you could still have, um, interests. Let's go that direction. You know? Yeah. Hobbies, interests. I could even, pursue a career in that world and it'd still be pleasing to God yeah, um, and still be an opportunity to, to build the kingdom. Like there wasn't a, in my mind, I think at the time there was still that dichotomy between, you know, regular life and ministry life or I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, it's huge. People compartmentalize all the time, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is my Jesus time and this is my non Jesus time. If you're a believer or not a believer, like it, perception can be reality in that regard too, for sure. Yeah. So, so that was one. Um, another one, though I don't remember a ton about the book, if I'm honest with you. I just remember I was reading it at the time. So that's why it's. <laughs> the book chill. was super impactful, but I can't remember anything yeah, about it. <laughs> but it was uh, Respectable Sins by uh, Jerry Bridges. Jerry Bridges. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was on a flight. I was doing some grad work. Um, it was hosted out at Mars Hill Church in Seattle. So I was on a flight to Seattle and reading this book for a class I was in. And um, it just. It was that year, so it would have been the fall of 2010. Something I was reading in that book just exploded the idea of God's grace in my head. Yeah. You know, that he was he was pleased with me for who I am, not for what I do. The whole, it really sparked just this passion for identity over activity. Hmm. Um, That's funny because a lot of people, when they read that book, they're like, I'm convicted. And you're like, I'm oh, encouraged. Yeah. <laughs> I was, for me, I was like, oh, man, this is freeing. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of Which people is, read I know, that. It's totally opposite. That's why I said I don't even remember what it was I was reading in there. But something in there struck me. And all of a sudden, I'm on this flight to Seattle and sitting there trying not to cry. And yeah. it was in tears. And it was just, it was like God's grace just exploded. That's, uh, that's in my mind in a unique way. That's a first. I've never heard somebody read that book and be like, I was so encouraged by it. <laughs> but congratulations. <laughs> I was telling that to somebody, I think I saw it to Steven the other day or a couple weeks ago. And he, he rattled off a couple other books. I'm like, no, it was respectable sins. He's like, really? <laughs> Are you talking about Stephen McCausland? Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. a friend of ours over in uh, Chicago land area. For those of you that don't know, that's too funny. Uh, any other ones? Um, so a couple others, I think church unique would be a big one mm. in the sense of, um, kind of sparked in me a passion for vision planning, some of those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, necessary endings is a good one. Henry cloud. I don't know if you've ever read that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cloud's got a lot of good stuff. It's, uh, yeah, he does. It's it's interesting. His his writing style is super interesting. Um, was popular there for a while and then kind of backed out or whatever. 
But, yeah. an another random one I was thinking about this the other day was, uh, have you ever heard of a book called Shackleton's Way? Huh. So it's um, about this guy, an explorer in the early 1900s named Ernest Shackleton. And it basically looks at his life and specifically a journey he took with a bunch of guys to Antarctica trying to reach the South Pole. Sure. And it's all it's all about leadership. So it tells a story, then it has like some kind of example of something that somebody took out of his life at the end. But long story short, he was going to going to the South Pole, they got shipwrecked, and he kept his crew of like twenty seven alive and in good spirits for like two years until they were found. He's like one of those guys. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating read, but really good. It's a good leadership slash history book. Huh. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> do you have like a certain book that you give out a lot or, or, I mean, some, some people do, some people have like a book that they're like, this is my go-to that I give to people. Uh, some people don't. I don't think I do. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of hit or miss. Like some people are like, oh yeah, I love like giving this one out. I've learned that people don't give out books as much as, um, they used to just mm -hmm. for whatever reason. It kind of is what it is um we're always interested in kind of the little things that make like a big difference right um i know you're kind of a tech guy uh at the core too as well but uh share with us a purchase or investment um most of the time we think purchases are investments <laughs> when in reality they're really <laughs> not right um but uh recent purchase or investment you've made uh that has a surprisingly positive in impact on your life it can be like a product service experience uh any any of those three things what um what kind of falls into that category mm. that's a tough question it is a tough question because so, you're racking up like get, you, you start looking around your room like what did i buy that is worth? I know, what did i get <laughs> but that's the one that's coming to mind so i did a kickstarter for these like sleeping earbuds you did a kickstarter oh like like you support no, I, I signed up for it and bought yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. so there are these Soundcore, which is like an anchor brand but little little earbuds that you can wear while you're sleeping well, who makes like them bluetooth anchor so Soundcore, i think is the actual brand but they're made by anchor okay um but they're these sleep pods they call them i think and you they just stick in your ear and you can lay on your side it doesn't hurt your ear and you can listen to stuff while you fall asleep do you listen to music while you fall asleep i do a lot of times yeah really music or a, yeah, or I listen to a podcast, or listen to Bible reading, something like that. I've done that before, and I legit like will um, wake up and like they're everywhere. Like I can't, I can't find it. <laughs> like where, where did this go? You know. But. So these, these things like tuck like right in here. They're just tiny. It looks like you're wearing a hearing aid if you don't. Do you use them for um, for like non sleeping music or no? I haven't no because I've got some AirPods too that I like. Gotcha. Um. That's fair. Oh, hey, here, here, I'll give you one other one. Okay, like give me recently, one. Sitting over here off Woot, but I like it's a clicky keyboard. Oh, like a like a um, uh, what's it called? Like uh, what do they call it? modular keyboards? Yeah, Something I think like so. That. You can you can peel off, you put, put your own keycaps on it and stuff. But who makes it's it? Keychron. Keychron. Key. It's spell it. K e y cron, c h r o n. Keychron. Keychron keyboard. <laughs> Somebody got, got a full bunch of them. Somebody got super creative on that name. Let me tell you what they did. <laughs> um, but you you feel more productive when you're writing because it sounds like sounds like you're productive. I had one for a while. Had a uh, a keyboard that was um, whatever they call them, and uh, I can't do it. It's too loud. Like, <laughs> I totally understand it. Like people that kind of who code a lot use them, and I I totally get it because like they just yeah. it helps them kind of like lock in or whatever. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, I had one for a while, and all I could think about was like how loud it was. <laughs> I was like, this is driving me crazy. <laughs> I was like, it looked cool, but I gave it to like you know uh, some millennial, and they're like, this is great, man. Thanks so much. I'm like, you're you're <laughs> it's like every keyboard we grew up with yeah exactly like these are from 1980 85 you know like you they were uh two dollars back in the day because everybody had one but whatever that's funny um with all the things that you've kind of gone through um you know obviously not everything has been a success failure is a yeah. stepping stone right to success um tell us about a time when you faced failure or a setback how you overcame it? Um, what did you learn from that experience? How's it kind of? How did that kind of shape you? Um, and we kind of want to hear like 
the failure. You know, if it's something that doesn't need a bunch of details or whatever the case is, you don't feel like sharing a bunch of details. Totally understand that. But there's usually one failure that sets us in a trajectory of success. Um, can you think of yours? I think of a couple right away. So one I just thought of that I hadn't thought of before or in a long time. When I was, so I went to Moody um, my senior year. Let's see. I had uh, Dr. Walton, Dr. Quiggle. Walton's over at Wheaton now. Um, but it was a senior seminar class that you had to have to graduate. And uh, took the class. But that year I was also the is this like first year or second year? Yearbook. Th- What's that? First year, second year, third year? Like what? This is my last year. Last this year. is my last Senior year at Moody. Year, yeah. So fourth year at Moody. I was the editor of the yearbook, so which was which was cool because I got paid to use some of my talent with design, and we did all kinds of stuff. And that's another story. I ended up winning a big national award on all that stuff. Really? Yeah. It was called the Pacemaker Award, which doesn't sound cool. But no, it's it sounds like you like gave a, somebody life. <laughs> I know. But it's called the it's called the pacemakers from the Associated Collegiate Press, and so I got to fly down to Orlando that summer, and got an award, and it was like me, and then all these people from. It was like uh, uh, MIT, Harvard, University of Georgia, University of Oregon, all these like journalism majors and stuff, right? And then this kid from Moody Bible Institute, and uh, so it was me. like a design slash. Uh, journalism award okay so they the way they described it that weekend was like a it's kind of a pulitzer prize of collegiate journalism in america so that was kind of cool that's a success so that's not a failure that's a success but the failure in that was i got really sick just because i got so busy trying to meet some deadlines with all that and ended up missing a handful of classes specifically that one um and I failed to touch base with my profs before it was too late. Oops. And so I ended up failing that course. I had to come back the next year for a semester just for that class. And, uh, you know, one of the things they said to me that just really stuck out, stuck out to me was, um, you know, when you don't let people know your need, so in my case with them, Cause I think I just, I didn't know how to approach it or what to say or what to do. And just young. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But he said, you know, you really, you rob people of the, of the opportunity to bless you mm. them to help you. And so that, that's always stuck with me. Um, but yeah, so it, that, that threw things off though. Cause then it was an extra year going home, working for a while, coming back, finishing at Moody for a semester. Um, and then ended up out here about a year later. So, Maybe I wouldn't have been here without that either. It would have been the wrong timing. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting how people can kind of whisper in your ear too a little bit. And he probably, it'd be really curious to go back to that guy and like talk to him and be like, hey, um, do you know what you said? Because some I mean, Mm. a lot of people don't even know. They're like, I said that. No, that's true. You know? And actually, I got a, so random, this made me think of this too. So Dr. Walton, um, he did the illustrated commentary from Zonderman or something on the New Testament. New and Old Testament, but I had an email from him probably, I don't know, whenever that got published five to 10 years ago, he had found a picture of mine from when I was in Israel of the Ela Valley. And so that's my one time I've been published professionally. So I've got a credit <laughs> in the Zondervan illustrated, I got five volume illustrated set of the Bible. You made it into the Bible. I did. The picture of Eli <laughs> is from my little pocket Canon camera. That's so funny. Before digital even existed. I know. Unbelievable. Uh, so the quote that he said, do you feel like that's kind of like your go-to message? Like if you had, mm. it, it, I'm sure as a pastor. You oh, I've used it many times. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like as a pastor, we kind of like say the same things over and over again. But if you have like wisdom and experiences that have been combined into one message and you're like this is what i say all the time you know what would it be and sometimes our spouses is better you to answer that question but like if you had like that go-to message to live and to strive to live that you like would impart think about it like this is the last message that i could give the world i'm on my deathbed this would be like the thing what would it be i think the big one it'd come back again to that when i was talking about bridges earlier but the the idea that identity precedes your activity mm. that um in a lot of ways you can't be 
So I guess, I guess parallel with that, you really can't be anyone or anything you want to be, but you can be everything God has designed you to be. And so he gives you identity first, and then that yields your activity. You don't need to achieve it. You know, religion, everything else is do this, do that. Um, and you'll achieve this identity when God's word is clear and the gospel is clear. No, you receive an identity and then you live it out. That it always it always precedes activity. Um, and I think you see it even in Genesis, you know, in Genesis 3, um, that's this, that's Satan's lie hmm. to Adam and Eve. And he's always trying to undo what God's created. God told them, I created you in my image, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. He said, here's who you are, now go live like it. Yeah. Satan says, hey, if you do this, you'll be like God. He doesn't want you to do this because then you'll be like him. And he kind of reverses it and says, if, if, if you do this, he'll like you enough. And so even, I think that's life in general, that's our default towards religion of, you know, on social media, if I get enough likes, if I've, as a pastor, if enough people come to my church or compliment my message or like me, like then that creates my identity. And I can still buy into that lie all the time. Yeah. But the, the truth is, no, this is, Josh, this is who you are in Christ. You're complete, full, everything you need to be there. Now go live like it. Do you feel like it's an affirmation thing? How so? Like, do you feel like... um when you say like identity precedes activity, like people are striving for that affirmation. Like, oh yeah, no doubt. So the watch, it almost sounds like what you're saying is watch your affirmation or where you get your affirmation from, I guess. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think people just strive so hard to achieve. Um, and maybe yeah, it could be affirmation thing uh, to achieve value, dignity, worth. I mean, you see it everywhere. You see it. We just had Mother's Day last weekend, right? So, you know our you know our story a little bit with Hannah and I have a lot of loss. Hannah would um, be Josh's wife for those of you. That yeah, that'd be my wife. Yeah. Um, but Mother's Day is hard for a lot of ladies because they feel like ah, I don't measure up because I I want to be a mom but I'm not. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you can put it anywhere in life. You know, I'm, if I'm single, I'm I'm not enough because I'm not married. It's like no, that none of those achievements, so to speak. Hmm have anything to do with your value dignity and worth yeah to do with your the fact that you bear god's image and that you're his yeah not to rabbit trail or side note but like that's kind of why as a church we always push towards everybody's got a mom instead of like congratulations all you mothers out there you know because there's yeah. always somebody that's sitting in that crowd that's like either feels like a failure as a mother or whatever yeah, the case true. is but yeah that's that's hard we do that a lot of times father's day is kind of similar to that too as well yeah. you know but, um, big quotes, uh, quotes or mottos that resonate deeply with you. Obviously you had a couple there, you know, um, in one of your failures too, you, you kind of alluded to a couple of those, but like, is there any quotes that kind of stick with you where you look at it and go, man, I go back to this one all the time. Hmm. I can't, I'm not thinking of one. Some people know but, quotes really well and some people don't. Yeah. But there probably is like, if I went back and searched through sermons and stuff, even that way, or yeah. if you asked Hannah, I bet she could tell you. <laughs> we'll do a follow-up interview with your yeah. wife. Get Hannah on here. We're like, hey, here's here's all the questions we asked your husband. Uh, where is he right, and where is he what wrong? Do you, where is he delusional? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, you know, like you're, uh, if she's listening, hello, Hannah. But you know, Hannah's probably like back there <laughs> thinking, like, that's really that's what you said. Like, mm. so if I start a fight at home, like I apologize in advance for that that whole thing. <laughs> Uh, we talked a little bit about, um, like, uh, you know, a purchase that impacts your life positively, but going into more like the investment side of things, like investment comes in a lot of forms. You have like money, you have time, energy, things like that. Um, what's the best or most worthwhile investment that you've made in your life? It could be an investment of any kind that's had like a significant impact on your personal or professional growth. Like what's, it could be something you do. It could be something that you, that you've spent money on, whatever the case is. But like when you think of a worthwhile investment that you've made, what would, what would that like land on? Hmm. I think, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of things. One, one that comes to mind right away as you're saying it though, was, on a sabbatical five, six years ago, I did a thing called Life Unique mm. uh, cohort. 
and um, basically it's looking at it, it's basically it's life planning gospel life design is what they build it as and how do you uh, in light of who you are who God's uniquely made you to be how do you live a life that and plan a life that that honors him and brings good to God glory or glory to God good to others and joy to you um, and really living out intentionally who you really are and so that's that's had a huge influence on me over the last five six years so that's a recent one is it is it called life unique like what's the actual organization yeah that's what's called life unique huh is it for just pastors or is it for other people too no it's for anybody so we've done a couple you know it, re- it's, it resonates with different people some people it doesn't at all we've done some uh I'm doing actually a cohort right now with a handful of people on Zoom going through some of their material. Um, and we've done other stuff too as a church with a little bit larger groups with some of it. But um, I think lifeunique.org or .com. Hmm. Um, yeah. It's it's an interesting – because I think there's one for pastors. This is where my mind was going. That's why I said – yeah. That's why I kind of like stutter stepped a little bit because I think there's one for like regular people and then there's also one for specific pastors too as well. Hmm. Um, but I can't remember. It's been a while since I've looked into that. All right, moving gears a little bit from from serious side to to kind of just some other things to get to know you a little bit. But uh, what's a unusual habit or absurd thing that you love? Could be like a quirk, guilty pleasure, um, like uh, something that you're like fond of that brings you joy. Um, I like style guides, like branding style guides. <laughs> what is a branding style guide? <laughs> so it's like a, like a document that an organization puts together with their logo, their colors, their voice, their font, anything related to their brand. Like this is who we are. This is how we present ourselves. Um, yeah, I just, I geek out on that stuff. So is it like, uh, like, a, a, like color schemes, stuff like that? Oh yeah, so it's everything. So it's like your logo, secondary, primary logos, different color taglines. It can be, it can be also be like a voice that you write or speak with, in terms of like what kind of language do you use. You know, never use this word. Always use this word. Really? Yeah. Who came up so with like it? Us, do you know who came up with the concept? Is it new or old? No, it's been around quite a while. Huh. So I've got a folder full of them, like <laughs> of PDFs. like yours or like other people's. Other people's. You just yeah. like, you kind of geek out on it. Yeah. And so we got one for the church too. I mean, it's just because that's how I'm wired. So that lays out like logo usage. It lays out like if you're up front speaking, this is how you should say these things this way, not this way, you know, that's refer to the, refer to it as the auditorium or worship center, not sanctuary. That'd be one. Do you make like people like memorize that before they get on stage? No, but we do a little training with them. Yeah. So this is kind of like a total side note, but do you think that ties into the way that you're wired in regards to how you remember like days and months? For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, Josh thinks in colors. (laughs) And I don't know if you can explain this, but I think it's fascinating. You're the only person I know. uh, I'm sure there's other people out there. So if if you're another person out there and you're listening to this and you're like, I'm that way please hit me up. Let me know. I would love to hear what you have to to say uh, because I think this is kind of fascinating, but explain a little bit like of how you process things in regards to, to colors. Yeah. I think everything's visual for me. So um, I think it's called, I looked it up one time. Synthesia, I think is what it's It's a real thing. Yeah, I've tried to trip thing. you up on this. I like, was kind of, uh, I was kind of geeking out when I found out about it. Yeah. I've tried to trip but you I up think- on this like a dozen times. I can't do it. No. Yeah. You, I think you kept a list one time and asked me a couple yeah, weeks later. I, go, I, gave you I still summary. have it. I'll go back to it and I'll be like, I know he's lying. <laughs> it's not there. So like intense forms of it will like see and even experience like sensory stuff in terms of smell related to words, numbers, any, any sort of thing. So for you, it's what? For like, me, it's, it's like, so every letter has a color associated with it. Every number does most every place on a map has a color related to it each country each um state things like that different words have colors associated with them so like for example like we can run this grid so like c is yeah. what to you purple okay it's kind of a grayish purple yeah and then like 17 is green okay and then you have like tuesday 
red. And then you have like April. April is yellow. So all those colors, when they match together, though, that means it, it's just dark. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I gave you a date. It just is, it's black. All those colors. Well, May, are- May is white. And one is white. So like May 1st. Actually, that's Hannah's birthday. So that's bright. It makes sense. Have you and you've always been that way, right? Yeah, ever since I was a little kid. So do you think that I don't remember not being that way. So do you think that kind of like absurd thing about you is the reason why you go over to like the um uh what what did you call them? Style the brands? style guides and yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 probably. I'm sure that's a lot of it. And gravitate to them. Yeah, visual anything visual that way. That's and like one of my favorite books is on typography. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, which is also super fascinating. Cause if you like design, it just makes mm-hmm. sense. Right. Like that's, yeah, that's there. All right. Moving into, uh, like, like new stuff, like where you're at kind of right now, what new belief, uh, changes constant, right? Growth happens. It comes stuff like that. Um, something new you've incorporated into your life recently that's made a positive impact. Hmm. Um, so I've been using, I don't know if I've, have I told you about obsidian? Uh, a little bit. So I've been using it off and on for a while, but I've started doing, um, daily notes in it. So uh, it's just a text editor slash some people call them PKMs, like personal knowledge manager or management. And you can, you can just store all kinds of text documents in it and it sounds super nerdy and kind of is. But one of the things, one of the plugins I use is like this daily daily note. So most mornings I'll sit down at the computer, hit this button, a new note pops up. Here, let me do it quick and I can tell you. Um, so it pops up. I've got three things on the top. Uh, what's my priority today? Something I'm grateful for. Daily meditation to reflect on. And so then I'll go, um, you know, read the word for a while and copy and paste something in or if I'm trying to memorize scripture. So, um, like this morning I wrote through, wrote down Psalm one and, um, just some things about it. And then a little section on today and write out, what do I have going today? What's going on? Sometimes it's a journal entry. Sometimes it's a bullet point list, but that's been a helpful thing for me. Is it and that's ju- been fairly recent last year or two. Is it all color coded? It's not. It just kind of bothers me. <laughs> it's like, can so I- you can get, yeah, you can get different, um, you can get different plugins like for how things look. Yeah. Um, so I need to learn how to code some of those. And You're like, I can make, man, make I just need them. this to be colored and it would be the perfect app. Yeah. Or like I need that font a little smaller or something like that. You should be a developer. Can you code? I can do HTML. That's about it. Mm, that's a dead. That's, I mean, yeah. it's still around. Don't, don't get me wrong. Much anymore. Somebody's going to rip me alive and be like, that's not dead. I'm, I know it's not dead, but I understand it's. Yeah, it's not like C plus plus or something like that, which that could be. Dead. I don't. I'm not a coder. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm just listing off things that I know that the internet uses to incorporate. JSON, PHP, Perl. Now you're things. in a whole different level. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Well, I'm a I'm a red tech, Jordan. I'm a, t- a redneck with my technology. I can I can hack it around and make it work usually, but is red tech it's a real? Not the right way to do it. Is red tech a real word? Like is that a real thing? Somebody I don't know. Said, that's what I call it. Uh, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Like, I didn't even know that was like a, like a word, but, oh man. All right. Um, and it's it, kind of a dark red word, just so you know. Oh, thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. Okay. Like, I'll remember, like, I'm going to write it down. <laughs> I'll be like, Hey, give me a dark red word. And you'll say the exact same thing, like two months later, like of exactly what I said, but yeah. Um, given all your experiences, insights, stuff like that, what advice would you give to somebody who's kind of navigating real world today? Like, uh, it could be secular, it could be Christian, you know, just somebody, let's say somebody just rolls in and they're like, Hey, I'm living in the real world. What advice would you give to them? Hmm. I think, um, it kind of goes back again to that identity piece of just rooting yourself in, in who, who God believes you are and says, not believes you are, says you are, that mm-hmm. you really believe those things too. Um, and, uh, to find your identity there, to start your day there, um, yeah, to to be careful about believing the lie. Not that you can't achieve a ton of things, but you you can't, in my opinion, you can't be anything or anyone you want to be, but you can be everything God wants you to be. Mm. So you and, think it's uh, a lie that people can do anything they want to do? 
Yeah. Hmm. I mean, there's, there's some, I get that. I understand the, that sentiment in the side of that, but I think it leads to some futility in, in chasing after things that are never fulfilling. Yeah. But when you know who you are in Christ and you discover and learn some of those things, then that guides the things you pursue mm. and so now they're fulfilling and they're rewarding and they're actually helpful to other people and they're energizing to you. And, um, when you can, when we can learn and figure some of those things out, it's a game changer. What about, uh, advice that people should ignore? Like what's some bad advice that people get that they should just either question or ignore it? Oh, most of the stuff on the internet. Um, <laughs> Anything online? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Which is like all information now, right? Like, just, I know, just right? Ignore, yeah, the just ignore really everything good. that you've ever read online. Don't worry about it. As yeah. this podcast is being posted online. <laughs> it's on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Think it over. Yeah, a little sketchy. I don't know. There's a lot of bad advice out there. What about um, one coming to my mind right away? Okay, so in your field, then, like, if yeah. if you go kind of move into that, um, what are some like bad recommendations that you hear in in the pastoral profession um, that you know practices you come across where you're just like, man, that's that's not good. Which I know how hard of a question this is for you because we were just talking about this the other day. Um, yeah, yesterday. Yeah, Josh has a really really hard time like saying anything bad about anybody. <laughs> so like advice people should ignore and bad recommendations are probably super hard for you. Cause you're like, that's negative, man. I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> but are there any, like, do you think there's any bad pastoral like recommendations? Oh, I know there are. I'm, now I'm struggling to think of some now. <laughs> there's a ton. When I was uh, doing some uh, some research for our conversation, I was like, these two questions he's not going to answer. I just know it. I knew it in the back of my mind. I was like, I should just <laughs> skip right over those. Oh, man. All right. There's your, there's your bad advice, asking Josh. <laughs> Don't question. ask Josh what's bad. It just doesn't end well. Anyway, moving along. All right. In the last five years, what have you become better uh, at saying no to? Um, counseling. Really? Like, like counseling other people. Oh, that's a good one. I'm, I'm not good at it. I, I'm a good listener. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll listen to you all day, but I'm not a good, I'm not a good counselor. Yeah. I think I, I cause people to spin their wheels and not make uh, much progress in things they need help with. So, um, I, I've learned to refer better. Um, and I, obviously I still, I still meet with people, still try to help them, but um, I'm just honest with them up front. Like I can, I can do so much, but then you need to know I'm going to, I'm probably going to refer you out or recommend this because I want what's best for you. And I'm probably not going to give you all the help you're going to need. Would you say there's a difference between listening and counseling? I think so. Yeah. Like if you... I think, I think a lot of counseling is listening, but on the counseling side, being able to interpret some of that and then give some clear steps and tools to work through it. Yeah. Like it's a hard thing for me. A, a true counseling session, either you have pastors who are really good at it or yep. pastors that just aren't good at it. And that's okay. I don't think that's yeah. a bad thing by any means. It's just a reality that we have to embrace. I think sometimes people will come into like a church setting and they'll think, well, this pastor, he he's obviously a counselor. And it's like, he, no, like he could be a really yeah. great Bible teacher, but not a good counselor. You yeah, know? 100%. And what happens is when people approach those pastoral um, uh, people in their profession, they think, you know, they're going to give me good sound advice and they get bad advice. And then that's where mm. church hurt comes from and stuff like that too. So that's, that's super tough because it's just a reality that people need to embrace that like, hey, your pastor might not be a good counselor and that's okay. Yeah. You know, give him some grace, which is, which is great. I do that yeah. to people. I tell people, I'm like, uh, I'm going to be way too blunt with you. Like just, I don't have that, you know, soft side of counseling in that regard. So I, I would share in that sentiment with you for sure. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell people to, I mean, I don't know where I heard this one time, but you know, if you're as a pastor, you're the shepherd, but sometimes you call the vet. Mm. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can't fix every problem you can't you don't have all the skills yeah jesus has and that's a really good point that 
you yeah like you can tend the sheep but there are things that only a vet can take care of which makes me yep. think what shepherds did back in the bible times when their sheep got yeah. sick hmm that's that'd be an interesting endeavor or whatever uh closing two uh number one when you feel overwhelmed or you get unfocused what do you do everybody has those moments where you know we kind of feel ourselves slipping a little bit but um what does josh do when he feels overwhelmed or unfocused one thing i do is i I look at some things around me um so i got three main spaces and i end up cleaning like uh so my office would be one my truck inside of my truck and then a couple spaces at home, like my home office and garage. And basically if three, two of those three are just in chaos mode, like (laughs) just there's crap everywhere. Like I'm, I've got to do something like that's usually a symptom of I'm overwhelmed with some other things. Hmm. That's interesting. I clean. What if all three of them are a mess? Oh, that's bad news. <laughs> There's a tragedy that's taking Then Han- Then Hannah starts cleaning it. <laughs> She's like, I know oh, when Hannah starts cleaning it, I'm in trouble. <laughs> She's like, I'll organize your life for you. Yeah. Because I know, yeah, 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 like things are bad. Oh, man. That's unbelievable. Anything else? Or is it just straight to clean? Actually, it's, it's funny you bring that up because people... Or it's something creative, one of the two. Yeah, like people will... Um, like if I'm organizing anything, people are like what are you thinking about right now? I'm like, Mm. I don't know. (laughs) Like, I just need this. This is unkept. It needs to be kept. So you're speaking my love language here of like, (laughs) yeah, like I'm the type of person that sits down at a restaurant and I'll like organize everything. Like, so it's, you know, level and, and not level, but like square or whatever the case is. And I'll eat with a couple of people and they'll just move stuff on purpose. I'm like, that's just a jerk move. Why would you do that? (laughs) Uh, last question, man. What is the one thing people never ask you, but you wish they would? Can I give you a million dollars? No, that's. <laughs> <laughs> I've it, never been asked that. Well, I'm sure. But is there something that people like rarely <laughs> ask you about, but you wish they would? That's a good question. Um, I don't know I, if it, if there was, it'd be something in the realm of, um, I mean, even some of the things you're asking, like just on the creative um side of how i think what i what i think about mm. in, in terms of i'm not articulating myself very well but like that visual side of things just my passion for design for um sometimes people look at it and go oh you're a you're a control freak and you're you know you're always in control of all those things but it's like that's just maybe, the way you think but it's it's who god's wired me to be like that's mm-hmm. just how i function yeah I don't know how not to do some of those things. Do you wish people would would it, um, intrigue about it a little bit more? Like, instead of be like, oh, that's the way you are, just would ask uh, oh, yeah, why you did what you did or whatever the case is. Would you get upset about that or would you would you lean into that conversation? No, I don't think I'd get upset about that. Some people would. You know what I mean? Like, why'd you ask yeah. me or whatever the case is. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um. All right. Yeah. Josh, you, you got through all of them, man. Like I did, I, I made it, man. That's impressive. Uh, so thanks so much for sharing insights, experience. Um, if people want to connect with you, um, where do, where do they go? Like, what's what's the like? If people are like, man, I want to know more about Josh. Like, where would you send them? Um, you, I mean, you can find my Facebook, but I'm never on there. So <laughs> I think you, your I think you, your profile picture is from like ten. Oh, years it's ago. at least twelve years old. <laughs> <laughs> it's from when Hannah and I were engaged, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um or when we were dating. So it's long. Uh probably just, easiest would just be email. So Josh Wyland at iCloud.com. Or the church, right? Or the church, Josh at Wawasebible.com. And then the church's website is Wawasebible.com. Or easier to remember is you are loved dot church. Uh that's that's way easier to remember. Well, man, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, yeah, I I think highly of you. Um, just killing Damn. it in the middle of four cornfields, right? Uh, That's true. Which is which is famous. Anything else you want to share? That's all I got. <laughs> I'm grateful for you. Absolutely. All right, to our listeners, you can find us all over the place. We're on Spotify, Apple, all those other things. So if you want to tune in, tune in, like, comment, subscribe, share. 
Um, if you know Josh, obviously hit him up. Um, if uh, it's been, you know, influential and uh, you think to yourself, wow, like I'd love to um, keep this thing going, then by all means, uh, share it as you see fit. We have more um, conversations coming up with a lot more individuals. So until um, that time comes, uh, we'll talk to you soon. God bless.